ago, Renan and I took the kids to uh, Ingham County Fair. And we noticed that, uh, of course, there's animals everywhere. And there's a giant bull that uh, had massive horns. There were cows, all different kinds of cows. I didn't know there was different kinds of cows. I thought a cow was a cow, right? There's all different kinds of cows. There's big cows, little fat cows, fluffy cows, all smelly cows. I noticed there's different kinds of chickens. There were chickens that had feathers on their feet. Did you know that? Chickens with feathers that cover their eyes? Just all kinds of animals. And we're looking at all the animals and all the animals smell. I'm looking at all the smelly animals. I had a, a random thought. I thought, what would happen if all of a sudden all the animals got out? Like they got out of the so they went loose. And you got, you know, goats, buck, bucking kids, headbutting kids or whatever. What if that happened? I think a couple things would happen. One, I think some people would just get out of the way. Ah! Right? But some others would stop thinking about themselves and they would do something to help, right? They would have to grab a little kid, you know, push back the goat that's headbutting them. They'd start picking up, they'd scoop up kids. Why, why is it whenever there's a crisis, there will always be those that just get out of the way. But there also will always be those that courageously will say, hey, what can I do to help? I've got to think beyond what I was going to do because all of a sudden there's crisis now and I've got to do something to help. Have you noticed that? Like we're at the one year anniversary of the horrific shooting at MSU, right? Where a person walked in, killed three people, wounded five others. It was horrific. It was ugly. And I noticed something happened that people that might not normally even hang out in East Lansing, all of a sudden I want to help. I found myself working out of a cafe in East Lansing at least one day a week because I just wanted to be around where people were hurting. I just wanted to be available to pray or to talk with somebody to help because something happens in us that says, hey, listen, there's something big going down and I want to help, right? Mount Hope, you are the people that don't run away. You're the people that say, I'm going to look beyond myself and I want to know what can I do to help. Thank you for being that way. It was in 1988, there were two whales that were caught behind ice. They were inland in Alaska, and the ice had frozen over. They could not get back out into the sea. So a couple of Eskimos came up. We got to help the whales. They got a couple of chainsaws. They drilled, uh, sawed some holes into the ice so the whales could breathe. Uh, that was enough. So somebody brought a massive, huge tractor, and they tried breaking up the ice. That was enough. So eventually, the National Guard came, brought two massive helicopters that were dropping down five-ton bricks <clears throat> to break up the ice mile by mile. Eventually, the Russians got involved, brought two ships. One ship had this 11-story, uh, 20-ton <clears throat> to break up the ice. It took three weeks 1.5 million dollars, they broke through piece by piece, 68 miles of ice to save the whales. And the world cheered, yes, the whales are free. If you're a whale person, you're like, yes, and that's good. I'm telling you that to say, as good as that is, how much more, how much more should we drop what we're doing? How much more should the whole world get involved in the greatest rescue of all time? And that is the rescue of mankind. There's nothing bigger, there's nothing greater, there's nothing more that captures my heart than the rescue of mankind. Come on, we must. If people, think about this, if people that don't even know God they may, they may know some things about him, but they don't know him personally. If a somebody who doesn't even know God has something grip them and say, hey, I've got to do something. How much more should those who have God living inside of them that when we see an opportunity, when we see a crisis, we don't walk the other way. We don't get out of the way. We run into the way. Say, how can I help? What can I do? I know this, time's running out. For this world as we now know the world, that time is running out. Jesus Christ is coming soon. And I hear the Lord inviting us today to be part of what is such on his heart, and that is this, the whole world. The whole world. For God so loved the world. He loves the whole world. And as we talk about what it means to have a generous heart, throughout this series. Generous heart, sure, that's our time. That's listening to somebody. 
That's taking care of those that we can see. Do you know we have a community of homeless people that are right across from the church now? Started out as two, now there's 22 tents. We had a team take them coffee and donuts. I believe it was Friday morning. Like, so there, there's some that are so close to us, but eventually that compassion, that generosity, it has to, it must reach out to the whole world. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning, the whole world. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 1.14, in fact, would you do me a favor? You've been standing a lot, I know. Will you stand with me one more time for the reading of God's word just out of a beautiful respect for God's word, God speaking to us. Again, the Bible is not somebody's opinion. It is God's word. And so out of respect for God's word, we stand. And here we have it, Romans 1.14. The Apostle Paul said, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not just giving his opinion, he said, for I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and the uneducated alike. I have a great sense of obligation to who? To people in every class. This obligation breaks down every social class barrier. It breaks through every language group. It has to go to the whole world. Father, we thank you for your word today. And I simply ask that in our next few minutes as we explore your words, God, I pray that you would do another deep work of grace inside of our lives. God, I pray that something inside it would grip us, that we too, like the Apostle Paul did, we would have a heart for the whole world. Certainly for those that we see up close, but also for those that we may never see until we get to heaven. God, give us a heart for the whole world. Give us a heart that looks beyond our very real own needs that are right in front of us, that stare us in the face, that we see the needs, the opportunities in others. I ask you to do that inside of us today. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. It's interesting how God got a hold of the apostle Paul's heart, who used to be a guy named Saul, who was a terrorist. He always wanted to do all of the things that he thought he had to do to earn rightness with God. He was doing what seemed to be a lot of the right things. But anybody who dared follow Jesus, he was working adamantly in opposition to them. So much so, he was jailing them, dragging them off into jail. Gladly celebrating as Christians are being stoned to death. All that was happening until the day that he met Jesus. And when he met Jesus and he got knocked off of what he thought was life, something happened inside. And he went from wanting to destroy Christians. He went from trying to earn what he thought was, would be salvation or eternal life. He went from that to, hey, you know what? Now I live with a sense of obligation. God, I was, I was walking the wrong way and God rescued me. I was doing the wrong things, but God rescued me. How could I not have a sense of obligation? Not that I can try and pay back God for what he did, because I could never do that. But I do have an obligation. If God did this for me, I now feel obligated to the people I see and know and to those that I don't even know. I feel obligated to the whole world. It's interesting that the early disciples that were, that were called what we are today, the church, God's family members, when God touched their lives. We read this, I believe, two weeks ago in Acts 4.32. It says that they looked at what they owned and they thought what we own is not even our own. So they gladly would sell houses. They had properties, whatever. They, they would gladly give what they had because they saw a need in somebody else. Who does that? Only those that God has touched our heart with his generosity. And something happens. We start looking at even the stuff that we worked for, that we earned, that we put blood, sweat, and tears to get a hold of. And we look at it and say, but wait a minute, I know it's legally mine, but it's not really mine. Even what I own, I don't think I own it. So if somebody else has a need, I will gladly give up what I think I own to meet their need. That never happens unless God does an amazing work of grace in our hearts. 
If he doesn't do that, we end up clutching on this stuff and holding on to it for all of our lives until this life is over. God calls us to something so much more grand, something so much more beautiful. It has everything to do with us getting our eyes off of ourselves and our eyes on the needs of other people and gladly being willing to help them. It's interesting, 2 Corinthians 9, 10, 11 puts it this way. I'll read this out of the message. This most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. Watch this. He gives you something you can then give away, which grows into fully formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. Very interesting. He gives us something. God gives you something you can then give away. And somehow this something God gives you that you can then, if you choose to, you can then give away that something. It becomes a life completely transformed. How crazy is that? That God can take something as simple as what he's allowed us to have or that we worked for. And as we choose not coerced to, there's not pressure to do that. But as we choose to give that away, he can take something simple and turn it into a life that is completely transformed. Listen, if, if following Jesus is very practical, following Jesus is not adhering to a, a different belief system, a different set of values. Following Jesus is practical if following Jesus is not practically got into your life, then, then I would encourage you to press into a little bit more what it means to follow Jesus because he wants to give us practical advice, practical guidelines, if you will, it, what it looks like to follow him. How are we supposed to live our lives being in him? And one of the ways has everything to do with us having eyes for the whole world. So again, that's why there's flags out in the hallway. That's why there's some Asian yummy treats out there in the hallways because I want us to be thinking in terms of the whole world. Say it with me. Say the whole world. Okay, now do me a favor. Everybody get in your pockets and grab some money. If you don't have any, get in your neighbor's pockets. No, don't do that. <laughs> and grab their money. Or if, see, I don't, if I don't carry cash, I get that. Then pull out your phone and pull up a cash app, right? If you've got a wallet, a purse, wherever you get your, however you do your stuff or for things online, grab, grab your device. Whatever you do, however you use cash, get it in your hands, Okay. Everybody got it? I want you to look at it. This is crazy. This is, we're going to read the words of Jesus in just a moment. But Jesus teaches us that something as simple as money that we worked for or we inherited, somebody else worked for it, it was blood, sweat, and tears that we legally own. It's ours that God can use something as simple as money to turn into a transformed life. For money to go from just being money to a transformed life, it has to go through the hands of somebody. So I had you pull out money or whatever you use to uh, disperse money. So I want you to think about, hey, something this simple could result in a changed life. Wow, you mean something as simple as money could change somebody's life? The question is, what are you going to do with it? As God puts it in your, in your hand, what are you going to do with it? Austin, it's a crisp $100 bill. Yes, sir. Here, hold on to it. Uh, okay. Yeah, just hold on to it. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. That, and then the Lord, the Lord does this. Like he gives us stuff. Well, we work for it, but he provides the jobs and stuff. He gives us stuff. God gave me life. I don't need that. Yeah, that's okay. He gives us stuff and he gives it to then say, then what are you going to do with it now? You know? And I'm just, you just think about it for a minute. I'm just really, it's really captured, it's captured my heart that God will use something. Because listen, money in bad hands does what? Bad things, Right? Money in good hands does what? Good things. It's, it's the hands that money makes its way into that makes all the difference in the world, right? And so what will we do with the resources that land in our hands? 
Will we choose to be people that will say, wow, God, you can take something as simple as this and somehow change that into a completely different person. God, sign me up for that. This is what Jesus has to say in Matthew chapter 6. He talks about first saying, hey, don't worry about how your needs are going to be met. He said, other people, they worry about that stuff. You don't have to worry about that. He said things like this, look at the birds. Like they're not worried about whether they're going to get food. Look at the flowers. They're not concerned how they're going to take care of them. I take care of them. How much more am I going to take care of you? But listen, when your needs are met and you have something left over, he says, what are you going to do with that? And then he gives us some guidelines for what we're to do. Here's what he says. This is Matthew chapter 6, the words of Jesus. Do, these are the guidelines he gives us. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths, vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin they don't destroy and thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Jesus gives us some guidelines for how do we handle the resources God gives us. What are we supposed to do with that? When our own needs are met, then what do we do with what we have left over? Jesus gives some guidelines, speaks directly to that. That's why I say following Jesus is practical. And he said, number one, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Don't do that. Storing up treasures for yourself, according to what Jesus said, is not a problem. It's where you store it up for yourself. If you store it up for yourself on earth, he said, that's a problem. Don't do that one. If you're doing that, you want to stop that one. Because on earth, thieves can break in and steal that stuff. You know, stuff can erode that. It will eventually waste away. What he's saying is, is if you're storing up treasure for yourself. Now, I understand the Bible says we should store up an inheritance for our children and our grandchildren. Like, I get that's biblical. But if you're storing up treasure for yourself in this earth, he said the reason not to do that is not because it might be lost, but it will be lost. It's, it's not a matter of feeling. It's just logic, pure logic. Don't store it where you know it's not going to last. He said, so if you're storing it on earth for yourself, don't do that. It was uh, just a few years ago. I was in Egypt with Pastor Scott who is now in Indonesia. And while we were there, I had the chance to go and see the tomb of King Tut. King Tut, he died. Uh, I saw his mummy. And he died when he was 17 years old and they buried him with all these gold chariots. Tons and tons and tons of gold because the Egyptians believed that in the afterlife, if they stored up all that wealth, they would somehow be able to take it with them in the afterlife. Well, guess what? It sat right there for 3,000 years until God discovered it in 1922. For 3,000 years, all that wealth just sat there. Why? Because it doesn't make its way to the next world. And this world, as we know it, is going to come to an end one day. So it's not going to last here. So do not store up treasures for yourself here. James 5 says this. He says it this way. Verse 3, your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. It sounds like there's some Christians that had a bunch of rusty money. Stuff that's going to wear out. And James was saying, hey, you don't want to store that up for yourself here. That's what Jesus is telling us. It's interesting that people store up treasures for themselves here on this earth. They also store something else up for themselves here on earth. And that's debt. We have, let me speak for just a second, a word of encouragement to, to beware of the debt monster. The debt monster will eat away at your ability to be able to give away. Pastor, I would love to give, but I've got so much debt, I can't give. Because the debt monster has seized what I thought I'd have and I would have otherwise been able to give away. Has anybody ever heard the movie The Creature of the Black Lagoon? Has anybody actually seen that movie? A few of you have. Wow. I'm surprised. It's old. I'm not saying you're old. I said the movie's old. There's something, I think Ed Young labeled it, 
And that is the, the, uh, the cash monster, right? It's this, it's, this, it's this monster, not the, the black lagoon, but the cash lagoon. It is a debt monster that wants to eat away at your opportunity to even be able to give. Do you know that America is drowning in debt? The average American uh, has at least seven credit cards. They have an average, average of $8,400 in credit card debt. And if you pay the minimum payment, it will take you 25 years to pay that off, $8,400. It will cost you an extra $24,000. There's $735 billion of credit card debt. The debt monster is eating people's wealth away. It's eating what could be generosity away. And I just want to encourage you, contrary to what we hear all the time, you don't have to live in debt. And if you are held captive by the debt monster, I want you to know, we want to help you. We have people, it is, they feel it is their ministry. This is what I get to do to help the body of Christ. I want to help somebody learn how they can get out of debt. You don't have to have a mortgage forever. It's a lie that you have to. Isn't it weird that we get offers every day, it seems like, to get another plastic people eater? You're pre-qualified to drown your life in debt. They don't say it like that. Oh, yeah, get more, get more, get more. We want to help you get out of that so you're positioned to be able to give when your heart wants to give. 90% of the divorces that take place is part of that divorce there's always an argument about money. Often, it has everything to do with debt. So I simply want to try and practically help you today. So Jesus, what did he give us as guidelines? Number one, don't store up treasure for yourself on earth. And I would encourage you also, and also don't store up debt for yourself. It was interesting, during World War II, there was a special hospital for shell-shocked soldiers that were suffering from mental disorders. And they wanted to discover, are they mentally okay to go on with life? You know what they would do? They would put them in a room with a mop and a bucket, and they would turn on a faucet in the sink and let it just keep running. They would, then they would tell them with water on the floor as well to clean up the floor. If the people would first go turn off the faucet and then clean up, then they know, okay, mentally they're going to be okay now. They're getting better. If they did not first turn off the water, they knew something's not right now. They're not, they're not okay yet because they're trying to clean up, but they're going to endlessly keep cleaning because it keeps on flowing. And I want to encourage you, stop the debt flow. You can't clean that up until you stop adding more. So be encouraged. You can and celebrate being out of free and living debt free. Okay, number two, that was just practical because I want to help you. Number two, Jesus said, do store up treasure for yourself in heaven. So, Jesus doesn't have a problem with treasure. He doesn't have a problem storing up treasure for yourself. He's concerned where you're storing up that treasure. And he says, oh, do store it up for yourself, but make sure you store it up in heaven. Interesting, isn't it? Listen, if you're storing up treasure, don't you do that methodically? Don't you do that conscientiously? Don't you keep track of that? So if you're storing up treasures in heaven, he's saying, keep the books. Keep good records. Do that and do it consistently and do it faithfully and do it with, with all of your heart and your mind involved in that because you're storing up treasure, real treasure for you. It just lands in heaven. So how do you go from storing up treasure on earth? What does it look like and how are we supposed to store up treasure in heaven? Is there a heavenly routing number we're supposed to use? I would say it this way. If we want earthly treasure, something as simple as money that can be so corrupt and used for so many bad things, but also could be used to change somebody else's life. Could be used for that. If we want it to go from being stored on earth to stored in heaven, it always has to go through your hands. It always has to get to somebody else. If it's going to go from being on earth to being for your account in heaven, it's got to get to somebody else. That's what we're going to learn from God's word today. 1 Peter 6, 17 says it this way. Teach those who are rich in this world. Let me pause for just a minute because someone might be thinking, well, Pastor Gov, this isn't for me because I'm not rich. Well, hold on to that thought because that's, that's what I thought about myself and Renee in our, our first house here in Lansing. We lived at the north end of Lansing, 
uh, right by, not far from where Pastor Dave used to live, the previous pastor at Mount Hope. And he would often say, like, I live in, we live in the ghetto. I thought, well, that's where I live. That's, I live in that neighborhood. And I live in the ghetto. So yeah, I guess we live in the ghetto. So that's where we lived. And I remember that our, our windows were so bad in our house that uh, I could literally poke the wood on the inside of my house. And my finger would make its way to the outside of the house. I thought, oh, that's probably not good. That feels a bit drafty. And I thought, well, how, how can I fix that? I mean, obviously they're saying there's a window company that says they'll do that if I want to do it on credit, but I don't want, to, I don't want the debt monster to get a hold of me. I don't want to do that. I don't have the money to buy new windows for a house. I felt, I felt trapped. Like I'm, I'm supposed to take care of my family. I don't know how to do this. And then I went on my first missions trip to Venezuela. And all of a sudden, I walk into this person's, the first house I walked into, it is a dirt floor. And the walls are made out of pieces of metal that they found, like sheet metal. That's what the roof was made out of, too. And I went home and thought, I am fat daddy rich. <laughs> I thought I was the poor guy that can't even get right windows. I'm, pff, I'm doing fine. Right? So by most standards of the world, if you live in America, you're probably doing fine. It does not mean there aren't poor people in America. Again, I just said we've got 22 right across where the church is right now. There, there will always be poor among us. So I'm not saying there's not poor, but I'm saying by the standard of most people in the world, if you live in America, you're doing okay. You probably have something that you actually could give to help somebody else. So coming back to this, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud or not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us what we need for our enjoyment. Let me pause for a minute. God wants to give us things, not just to meet our needs, but also for us to be able to enjoy life. Think about this. God made the whole world and gave us the world for us to enjoy. God doesn't mind giving us things to meet our needs and things for our enjoyment. But tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. Watch this. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so they may experience true life. Earthly treasure only makes its way to a heavenly account when it makes its way through your hands to somebody else. That's how God designed it. I don't fully get it. I just know that's the way God designed it to be. I know God designed it to be that if I'm willing to take some of what he's given to me, and if somehow he can even get a hold of my heart that I realize even what I think is mine is probably not really all mine. So if they've got a need, of course, how can I help, right? And somehow when I choose to do that, God will somehow use that. Something simple. Something that could be used for evil. God could use that to transform somebody else's life just like he's transformed my life. It's interesting. I was thinking Christmas a few years back. It was Christmas morning and I was just thinking about all that God has done for me. And you know how you, you, you just get so caught up in how good God is to you and all that he's done for you. And I was thinking all the good that you've done for me. God, my life is been set on a totally different trajectory from what it could have been. I could have been such a disaster, but look what you've done. You've rescued me. You've redeemed me. I've got purpose in every step now. And I thought, Lord, what, what can I give to you? Like you've given so much, I could never give anything that would like pay back. That'd be crazy. I could never do that. But nonetheless, I want to give you something. It's Christmas day. What can I give you? And the Lord reminded me that just a couple of days earlier, there was a young man that I had been mentoring when St. Vincent's had a, uh, a children's home. I was mentoring a kid there, and I always find it fascinating. Every, every student I had the privilege of mentoring, they all wanted to be in the NBA. They all did. All of them. And I could beat all of them in basketball. <laughs> and I'm horrible. So I'm playing basketball thinking, and they're talking to me like, I can beat you. If I can beat you, you have no hope. I didn't say it, I just thought it. 
But this, this one young man, he said he wanted basketball shoes because he's convinced, I'm going to be in the NBA, so I need basketball shoes. And I remember going out to the mall, and we, we just got a pair of shoes or whatever. So that morning, Lord reminded me, oh, you want to do something for me? When you do something for them, I count that as you doing something for me. Isn't this what God's Word teaches us? That as we do to the least of these, somehow that gets turned into what I did for him. And somehow it lands from my earthly account to this heavenly account, storing up treasure for myself even in heaven. So if you want to see how this thing works, how this transfer works, I wouldn't consider everybody who gave something to help renovate our kids' space here at Mount Hope. What I want you to do when you walk through the halls of the church, make sure you stop and look into the eyes of some of the children. And when you look at the eyes of children, you're going to see an entire generation that has been radically changed because you gave. Because you gave, there's a space where kids are learning about who God is. They're knowing God. They're worshiping God. They're experiencing God. And generations are impacted because you simply gave. Look in their eyes and you see, oh, that made it to a heavenly account. God, thank you for letting me even be part of that. For those who were able to give something to the churches in Kenya. Come on, all you have to do is to look into the eyes of Kenyans who one time were worshiping underneath a tree because they did not have a building. So they would worship under the heat and under the sun. They would worship through the rain because they did not have any building until you, Mount Hope, said, oh, they have a need. I have something I can help with. And you help build 20 churches in Kenya. Thank you. It's amazing how God takes something so simple. He lets us be part of something so grand. I think of Bogey. We recently had one of our missionaries here from Mongolia. His wife shared how she led a young girl to, to Jesus. Her name was Bolga. And Bolga was the first in generations and generations and generations in her family, the first to receive Jesus. That also ended up uh, leading her grandmother, who is 100, 103 years old, led her grandmother to Jesus, first in generations in their family that came to Christ. How did that happen? How did those lives all the way out in Mongolia get changed? Because here in Lansing, Michigan, you gave. The missionaries could not be there unless we gave to fund them so they could be somewhere else in the world telling people who Jesus is. You gave. Come on, we watched a video at the very beginning of today's service of a tragedy that was happening in India where girls, children, were being trafficked. And we heard about this tragedy and we, we, we said we want to be part of helping and we helped build a home. Not just one, we build a home for girls, we build a home for boys, we build a school, we build a school where these children are now being cared for, they're being mentored, they're learning about who Jesus is, and you have a major part to play. I want you to look into their eyes and see what simple giving can do. Let's take a look at this. Come on. <clears throat> I know what that does to you, but when I look into the eyes of a little girl that was living a nightmare and I see her smile, when I see joy in that little boy's face, um, I'm grateful that I didn't, just, I didn't hold on to, I didn't, just get, I didn't just get one more thing that I could have but I'm grateful for the opportunity to take something as simple as money and allow it to be turned into a transformed life. And there were so many that responded from Mount Hope. 
In churches across America, we partnered with at least 13 other churches specifically to give to that. We were able to build in more than just one village. We went to even multiple villages to build homes for kids. So Mount Hope, thank you for giving. Thank you for changing people's lives. through Something as simple as giving. God, thank you. John Wesley said this, it's not how much will I give God, but how much of God's money will I keep for myself? Is that an interesting thought? It's, he sounds to me, John Wesley sounds like, that to me sounds like Acts chapter 432. It's never about how much of, how much of my money I'll give, because I don't even think what I have is mine anymore. It's how much of God's money will I, rather, how much of God's money will I keep? Now how much of mine will I give to him? Last thing that Jesus tells us, guidelines is what God wants to do with the resource he gives us. Do not store up treasures for yourself on earth. And I add also, don't store up debt for yourself. Do store up treasures for yourself in heaven. How do we do that? It's always through people. From your neighbors to those across the other side of the world and the nations. Last thing that Jesus tells us is, your heart will always follow your treasure. With Jesus, it's always about the heart. It's always about the heart. It's never about money. God, we said it before. God's not raising funds. He's raising children. And he wants to raise children that have the right heart. Your heart will always follow your treasures. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Practically, Jesus is saying, show me your checkbook. Right? Show me your visa statement. Show me your cash app and I'll show you where your treasure is. Well, Pastor Gav, I would like to have more of a heart for kids in India or other people in the world, but I just don't. Well, I would say, well, then start giving that way and you will. Your heart will follow where you put your treasure. As surely as the compass follows north, our heart will follow where we put our treasure. But Pastor Gav, I would like to care more for the poor. Oh, well, then you will. If you put some treasure there, your heart will start to go there. Come on, if, if today, if you've never invested in silver, but today you invested in silver, you know what happened? All of a sudden you start thinking about silver. I wonder what the price of silver is. I used to not even care about it, but now my heart wanders throughout the day. I wonder where silver is today. Why did that happen? Because where you put treasure, your heart now is gonna drift that way. That's what Jesus is saying. He's always saying, man, put your treasure in heaven. Why? Because your heart's going to always drift to wherever your treasure is. Do not store up treasure down here or your heart will always drift and be locked into this temporary place called the earth as we know it today. It's always about our hearts. When Jesus encountered a rich young ruler who wanted to know I have eternal life, Jesus went through the long conversation. You know, have you done this? Have you done this? I've done, I've done it all, but something's still missing. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19, 21, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Watch this. And you will have treasure in heaven. You know, Jesus doesn't call us all to sell everything that we have and give to the poor. Most people that God touches their heart, they don't go sell everything they have, but we do give out of the surplus that we have. Why did Jesus ask this young man to sell everything? I'll tell you why. Because his possessions had possession of him. He became possessed by his possessions. And the only way to get out of that was, oh, you're going to have to give it all away. If you give it all away, you're going to get so much more. If you would just get rid of all of this that now is possessing and holding on to, you'll find that now you have so much more wealth in heaven. Come on, the best is yet to come. But he walked away sad because his possessions had possession of him. Grabbed a hold of him. I pray today that God would give us a heart for the whole world. That we would never allow, as this young man did, we would never allow wealth, things to become an idol. And the only thing to do with an idol is you've got to get rid of it. That we'd never let that take possession of us. Instead, I pray we would always, we'd always realize this. The money you hold in your hand can change a life. 
It's up to you. It's in your hand. You worked for it. You know? God gave the capacity, the ability to work, and it's in your hand. The giant question is, what are you going to do with it? Can we use something this simple to change people's lives? Emphatically, yes, we can. Yes, we can do that. It's crazy to me that somehow God can take resources from our hand today and it can, make it, all, it can make its way all the way to China to a pastor who's currently hiding in a basement because his members are being killed. He'll refuse to not stand up for Christ, but sometimes he has to hide to save his life, to continue to be able to be around to minister to somebody. Something's practical as money can make its way to Nigeria where Christians are being slaughtered to help somebody who's desperately in need right now. Something as simple and little and insignificant as money can become something so valuable that it could change the life of a child in India, Cambodia, where they're currently living a nightmare. And the missionaries are asking, Mount Hope, will you give to help them? Will you see the crisis? And would you think again, as you do all the time, will you again think beyond yourself and say, I want to help somebody else? Baffles me the way God does this. Even as we send a team next month to an orphanage in Guatemala, that somehow God can use our, our resources to bring a changed life in a child who's been beaten. I've seen the scars on their face. Not to mention the scars that must be in their hearts, but we get to go. Love on them, pray with them, speak life into them, encourage them. I would like you to do me a favor. If you would, just stick out your hand for just a moment and I want you to look at your hand. I'm simply gonna ask that we would, we would end today by you, you making where you are a place of prayer. I want you to look at your hand and say, God, it just got to come out of you. So I'll just give you an idea. It could be something like this. God, would you please use this hand? Use something as simple as resources that you've, you've allowed me to have access to. Will you, will you use this hand to be a blessing and change somebody else's life? Will you pray that with me? God, will you allow us, like the Apostle Paul, to start having a concern for the whole world? a sense of obligation to the whole world, the world we see and those that we don't see. Come on, right now, begin to pray. Ask that. Ask God to work, do a work of grace in your heart. Ask God to take you to a whole different level and dimension of living out a generous heart for the needs that other people have that are so real. Come on, do this. Will you allow us who can hear your own voice? I can hear some of you and it's beautiful. God's listening to every word you're praying. It's a prayer you can guarantee God's gonna answer this one. God, thank you for doing a massive work of grace in our hearts. I know, God, you've marked this church as a generous family and I thank you for that. And God, may we always be that way. May we always look beyond ourselves to see the needs in others. God, may you do something so grand in our midst that we start to even look at our stuff and realize, but it's not our stuff. God, what do you want to do with that? We were thinking this, but what are you thinking? Lord, nobody does that. Nobody acts that way unless you do something deep inside of us. Nobody's talked into that. Like there's not, a, there's not pictures that move us for that. That's something that you, only you do in us. I'm asking God what you've done in the Apostle Paul and what you've worked in me. God, would you continue to work this in our entire church family? Thank you, God. Hello, and thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed that message of hope and have been encouraged in your relationship with Jesus Christ. What is the next step God's asking you to take? I would encourage you to check out Growth Track. It's our delight to come along your side and help you reach your full kingdom potential. To give now, you can simply click Give on our website or text any amount to 84321. It is your faithful giving that allows us to continue to preach the gospel and make disciples from our neighborhoods to the nations of the world. Thank you and God bless you.